So hello guys, and uh, we are actually on now. So we will be talking about acid base uh, balance today. And the uh, first part is uh, about conversion factors. You need to actually know about conversion factors. And uh, a lot of times the units are given in millimoles and you want to convert into milliequivalents or milligram percent. So uh, these are the uh, conversion factors. It's easy for sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb because uh, the millimoles and milliequivalents uh, are interconvertible. And um, whereas uh, for calcium, because it is Ca2 plus, uh, so if you have to convert millimoles, then you have to multiply by four uh, to get a milligram per deciliter. Uh, urea, you have to multiply by 2.8. Uh, creatine by a small value of 0 0.0113. Uh, glucose by 18. I actually discussed about this because uh, in UK, uh, everything is in millimoles per liter. Um, so we have to actually convert milligram per deciliters when you're looking at uh, how you convert the, uh, you know, your requirement of insulin. So because that is a, a milligram per deciliter divided by 100 or 150. Uh, albumin again, uh, it's uh, a milligram per deciliter to liters, uh, then you have to multiply by 10, or from gram per liter to milligram per deciliter, you have to multiply by 0 0.1. Right? So, uh, coming to the arterial blood gas machine, actually, everybody looks at it and says, Well, what a complex piece of equipment this is. Okay, you it looks big, it just looks uh, very daunting. Uh, you put in a blood gas sample and then it starts to start, uh, you know, churning out uh, data after data. Uh, depends on uh, what kind of a blood gas machine you have. Uh, some blood gas machines will give more uh, information uh, than uh, others. And uh, some will also give electrolytes, lactates, glucose, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is important for uh, most machines. So what does this machine actually concern? So I'm going to just break it down into a very simple uh, part. So if you look at it, this is what the uh, uh, blood gas machine has. These are the main electrodes, though there are other electrodes as well, uh, ones that are actually used for monitoring, uh, measuring the uh, your hemoglobin and lactate. But this is this is what it is. So the machine is kept at 37 degrees. So there's a temperature control, microprocessor control. Uh, we have pH electrodes, there's a reference electrode, there is a CO2 electrode, there's an oxygen electrode. You actually we have put in the sample uh, through one of the chambers. There is also a flush chamber, so once you actually have, you know, put the sample in the blood gas, it needs to be flushed out. And also from time to time, there you'll see that there is calibration, so there are reference values and calibration uh, uh, fluids uh, which are needed for calibration and uh, obviously they are flushed out uh, after uh, they have done their job. So these electrodes when the blood comes in contact with this uh, electrode they obviously there is uh, analog to digital conversion happening so units like uh, your uh, uh, electrical units will be converted into units which we can actually uh, uh, you know which we are so used to uh, uh, so say for example PCO2 or O2, this uh, current which is generated has to be converted into a digital numbers. Uh, so we have analog to digital converter. And this is obviously done by a microprocessor. And uh, it actually then um, you know gives you the value of pH, PCO2 and PO2 which are actually measured. It also does some calculation, that's why you need a microprocessor, so it will actually do uh, certain calculations to give you value of bicarbs, uh, base deficit or base excess as it's called, uh, saturation. Okay. So uh, if you actually look at it, they are. So hemoglobin is actually a very important part of uh, measurement. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in some older machines they use photometrically. Uh, so it's a simple measure. Uh, but the newer machines use co-oximeters. Okay. These are more accurate. And for this, the blood has been hemolyzed, and uh, once it is hemolyzed, uh, then it is subjected to spectroscopy uh, or 
uh, photospectroscopy and uh, they use around six to eight wavelengths. So because you use a number of wavelengths and they are able to measure not only the total hemoglobin, uh, but they will actually give you fetal hemoglobin, um, oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, self-hemoglobin. So values of all the other hemoglobins which can actually affect the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So this, these are actually important how hemoglobin is measured. But when we actually look at the blood gases uh, analysis, uh, we're looking at how the oxygenation, how is the ventilation, what is the acid base. Uh, so oxygenation, we look at PA2 and the saturation. Ventilation, we look at the PCA2. And then for acid base, we look at the pH of the blood gas, the bicarb levels, we look at the anion gap, we look at the base axis. Uh, so these are some of the things. And then obviously there are other uh, factors, anions and uh, cations, which are also measured, like I said, so sodium, uh, potassium, chloride, magnesium. Magnesium is not measured by blood gas. So lactates, of course, lactates are very, very important. We'll uh, look at uh, the importance of that. Uh, things which are also important, which are not measured by the blood gas is albumin levels. But obviously that doesn't change from you know time to time, and uh, they're usually constant unless uh, there is a massive uh, surgery. Uh, and, uh, mega surgery going on. Uh, so uh, having albumin levels uh, from the labs at the beginning of the uh, in our major cases is actually very, very important. And I'll tell you what's the importance of knowing the albumin. So the measured values are PaO2, PaCO2, pH, hemoglobin, okay. uh, other miscellaneous uh, ones which are actually measured directly of blood sugar. And uh, these are important, some of them are important for measuring anion gap. Uh, lactates, okay, these are very, very important uh, when you're looking at uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's happening at tissue levels, if there is anaerobic metabolism going on, or uh, if lactates uh, also go up when there is problem with the liver. So in case of, of liver resection, so that becomes important. Uh, electrolytes obviously are important. Sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium are measured by most uh, machines. And these are important for the anion gap, or if you're looking at the strong ion gap, SID, uh, which is used uh, in the Stewart uh, method of uh, acid base uh, status or balance measure. And um, so the, this information becomes equally important when you're looking at acid base status. So when you're buying a blood gas machine, it's uh, important that these all are taken into account. Uh, like you might also need to know the blood sugar levels uh, uh, when you're looking at the plasma osmolarity. Okay, that is an important part. And I will discuss that in the second part of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, our lecture. So this is a uh, oxygen electrode. Um, this is called Clark's electrode. So this is different from our uh, electrode we use for uh, monitoring oxygen uh, in the machines. Okay, uh, that is a fuel cell. So this is not a fuel cell, and uh, this is called a polographic uh, cell. And this has got a platinum cathode, and it's got silver, silver chloride anode, and uh, the electrolyte here is KCl. So when blood comes in contact with this system and the oxygen uh, actually reacts at the cathode, so it is consumed at the cathode, a reaction is, uh, is generated and this generates a potential uh, which is then converted from by the analog to digital converter into the units, okay, now which we are so used to in partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. So this is the Clark's electrode. And this uh, uh, I can describe later on when uh, I talk about in physics of the electrodes, how this is different from your fuel cell. Okay, so then, then they can actually discuss that. Okay. Then uh, we have the uh, pH electrode. Uh, pH electrode is a uh, basically pH sensitive glass electrode. And, and so they have the silver silver chloride electrode, which is attached to a pH sensitive electrode. And there's a reference electrode. So when the blood comes in contact uh, with the glass electrode, it generates potential, which depends on the hydrogen ion concentration. Again, this potential is converted by the analog to digital converter into units we are so used to, that's pH 
So hydrogen ions will be then my you know microprocessor will convert the units into pH units. So we will know what the pH of the electrode is. So this is a pH electrode, and this is uh, the uh, pH sensitive glass electrode. And then we have the CO2 electrode. Okay, so we have uh, basically this is a modified uh, pH electrode. So if you look at the components are similar to the pH electrode, it has got a, a reference cell, it has uh, got pH sensitive glass. But what we have between the sensitive glass and the blood uh, is a buffer solution, right? So in the buffer solution, the carbon dioxide diffuses and uh, it uh, combines with the hydrogen ions, forms carbonic acid. This carbonic acid is then dissociated with hydrogen ions and bicarbons, and it is the hydrogen ions uh, which then are measured. Okay, and this hydrogen ion concentration is then converted into CO2. So, even though this is a direct measurement, this is called a Severingos uh, electrode system, and uh, this is. Uh, this is this is uh, a very. Uh, I'm just actually reading some of the messages, uh, but that's fine. You need to just use your headphones if you're not able to actually hear properly. Uh, please use your headphones or increase the volume on your uh, monitor. So the derived uh, values of variables are by car. Uh, we have base axis or base deficit. Uh, they're buffer base. And we'll go into some of these, uh, uh, you know, units, how they are actually measured or they are actually uh, described. So when you look at the blood gas, uh, your, uh, you know, the paper comes out. <laughs> uh, so there you will actually see that there is actually total or actual bicarb levels. And uh, there is standard bicarb level. So there is a difference between total and actual bicarb and the standard bicarb. So uh, the uh, actual or total or actual bicarb is calculated by the blood gas machine and that uses the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. Uh, pH is equal to pKa. Uh, pKa is of the blood is 6.1 uh, plus log 10 arterial bicarb divided by PSU2 by 0.03. So uh, the pH has been measured by pH electrode. PSU2 has been measured by the Severingos electrode. So because we know this, we know the pK value is 6.1, and so the computer will likely then put in this value, and you can get the arterial bicarb. So this is a is a derived value. Okay. Whereas when you talk about standard bicarb, this is bicarb levels which are actually standardized to normal CO2 and temperature. So the temperature of the sample taken can be anything, right? So if the patient is in the theater, the sample might be taken at 35 degrees, so this is normalized to 37. Uh, depending on how hard you're ventilating the patient or how this thing, so you might be actually ventilating them uh, too hard, where the CO2 may be, you know, like 35 or, you know, 30. Uh, but here it is normalized to 40 millimeters of mercury. So uh, the bicarb in a fully oxygenated blood sample, so uh, assumes that uh, the uh, blood is fully oxygenated and has a PCO2 of 5.3 kPa, which is 40 millimeters of mercury, and temperature of 37 degrees. Okay. Okay. So it assesses the contribution of metabolic factors, and because the CO2 is being normalized, okay, it ignores the contribution of carbon dioxide. Okay. So carbon dioxide levels also depends on the temperature as well, as we know. Okay. As the temperature goes down, the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the blood will also go go up okay so we know that these are standardized uh, to the temperature it's fully oxygenated blood okay. so looking at the base deficit this is a very very important uh, uh, measurement we actually have to look at it obviously tells the indication of the metabolic rather than respiratory acid base uh, uh, disturbance and the amount of, uh, so it is base deficit or base excess is the amount of tritable acid uh, required to correct a blood sample pH of 7.4 at a PCO of 5.3 and a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So again, uh, this is standardized. Okay, so it's standardized to a pH of 7.4 uh, 
normal CO2 and normal temperature, body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. So if you look at the base axis, uh, we know that the normal values is actually should be zero. Okay, but the normal range is given as minus three to plus uh, three millimeters of mercury. Okay. And when uh, it is negative, uh, uh, then it is considered to be that there is some metabolic acidosis. And when uh, the uh, values are positive, and uh, then uh, we know that there is uh, metabolic alkalosis. And here uh, for base uh, axis doesn't matter, millimoles and millicoulants are the same, they're inter interchangeable. Uh, so, um, if you look at with acute respiratory changes, uh, we do not expect uh, any base axis changes. Okay. And uh, it's important to see that in uh, chronic uh, respiratory changes, so patients who actually have retained CO2, for example, uh, in patients uh, with COPD, and now this has been the uh, CO2 has uh, been there uh, high uh, for a long time. And it is seen that uh, the base axis actually goes up by 0 0.4 millimole per liter uh, per one millimeter increase in the uh, PaCO2. So every CO2 amount uh, will actually increase the base axis by 0 0.4 millimole per liter. So this is only seen in, in chronic respiratory uh, changes. This, is, this does not actually happen uh, in uh, the acute uh, conditions. So this is very, very important to know uh, when we're talking about uh, the mixed uh, metabolic and respiratory, uh, you know, acid-base disturbances. And uh, this is also important to know uh, whether the uh, respiratory acidosis or alkalosis is acute or chronic. So in the second part, I will actually uh, again go through this uh, in details, how this uh, values actually become uh, important. So one other thing uh, which um, has been and recently been, I won't say very recent, but uh, this has been, uh, you know, said that this is one of the easiest methods of understanding acid-base status uh, is uh, by looking at strong ion difference. Okay, this is called, called Stewart's method. And uh, they think it is important uh, that uh, they have simplified the whole aspects of acid-base status. Yeah. And uh, this is a very important uh, figure, and um, this is called a gamble gram. Uh, so this was described by Gamble, so that's why it's called a gamble gram. Now, if you look at the strong ion uh, difference, what you're looking at is, is the difference between cations and anions. Okay, strong cations and strong anions. Now here, the bicarb is not part of the equation. And uh, why it is not? Because uh, if you're looking at the strong ions are strongly dissociated, whereas bicarb is not. Okay. So the cations, uh, strong or uh, the strong uh, cations we're talking about are here are uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And like uh, some of these are easily measured uh, by the blood gases, so sodium, potassium, calcium. Are. And the strong anions are chlorides and lactates. So if the strong ion difference is reduced, that means uh, that there is squeezing of the bicarb. So you look at the diagram closely, and you can actually see that uh, the uh, uh, in the graph, the gamble gram, the, you have the positive ones, uh, and you can actually see that uh, the uh, you know, sodium, sodium is uh, uh, as large component, and other cations like potassium, calcium, and magnesium actually have got a small component of it. Now, if you look at the anions, anions, the chlorides are very important. Okay, these are something we measure every day. Then we have lactates, and we have other anions, okay, negatively charged particles. And we have albumin, which is normally constant, okay, 
And so that only becomes important if uh, when you're actually measuring it, uh, you know, regularly. Uh, the blood gases will not measure it. And then there is bicarb. Now, uh, bicarb is not strongly dissociated. Okay, uh, it's present as uh, uh, bicarbonic acid H two CO three. Okay. Uh, so carbon, uh, carbon dioxide reacts with uh, water uh, very strongly in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, uh, which is present in large amounts uh, on the cell membranes, uh, even uh, you know everywhere. They, it's easily, it's in the blood as well. So, uh, and it causes the water and CO2 to combine to form carbonic acid. Like it's, so, uh, they're not. Uh, this is actually they are not that strongly dissociated as other ions. sodium and chloride they can actually dissociate very easily calcium chloride can dissociate easily magnesium chloride can dissociate okay so that's that so what uh, the uh, srd actually assumes that there is electronegativity that is the positive ions and the negative ions are actually equal in numbers So if uh, anything actually increases on the anions, okay, so if there is, say, example, increase in the chloride, so increase in lactates or other anions, they will squeeze the bicarb, okay. So bicarb is squeezed. Okay. So if you're looking at the difference between the strong uh, cations and strong anions and uh, the, the difference uh, between them, is considered to be because of the presence of bicarb and a weak acid uh, that is albumin. Okay, these are the two things uh, which decides the difference uh, between cations and anions, or rather say that they fill the gap for electron uh, neutrality. That is, uh, if you need to actually look at the uh, positive sequence negative, okay, and then the gap uh, between the positive and negatives is filled by bicarb, which is negatively charged. Uh, albumin, which is also negatively charged. So these two are important factors in this uh, gamble gram. So have a look at it this very closely. And this is a very, very important uh, part of the uh, Stewart method. Okay. So talking about uh, weak acids and uh, what uh, the principal two weak acids in the uh, blood are albumin and phosphates and they are partly dissociated and hence they're not called strong ions okay so they need to be something which is strongly dissociated from the strong anion difference okay. so if you look at uh, the uh, gambelogram it says the total weak acid concentration doesn't influence the uh, strong anion difference that much and uh, so but when the there is a decrease in the strong ion difference that means then there can be increased total weak acid concentration and this can lead to acidosis. So uh, assuming that the bicarbs are actually uh, normal, uh, in that case that and still there is acidosis present, then it might actually suggest that the total amount of weak acids actually have increased. Okay. And the opposite occurs for alkalosis. Okay. So if the strong iron uh, difference is actually increased, um, and there is quite possible that the amount of total amount of weak acids concentration may be low, assuming the other factors are normal. Okay. So the uh, principal element of the uh, plasma strong ion difference is basically sodium on the left side and chlorides on the right side. Okay, so they are easy to measure sodium and chloride. Uh, even you can measure it uh, uh, in the blood circuit, okay, not even blood gases are required for this. So you measure the sodium and chloride and uh, you look at the difference. So the normal difference is around 35. Okay. And uh, then we actually look at the, uh, the difference uh, between the sodium chloride uh, and that is called the base effect of this uh, strong ion difference. So we looked at the measured sodium uh, minus the measured chloride, the whole thing together minus the 30 minus 35. Uh, okay, this is uh, called the uh, sodium chloride base axis effect. Uh, and I'll explain to you uh, in the next slide how this is important. So, for every one millivolt change in the uh, sodium chloride difference, uh, the base axis will change by one millivolt uh, in the negative direction. Okay. 
uh, if that is if the sodium is reduced and in the positive direction if the sodium is increased so uh, let's look at how hyponatremia can actually cause uh, acidosis okay so if you look at the sodium and chloride uh, base excess effect so we assume that that the your sodium levels actually in the sample has come as 120 so patient has got hyponatremia so if you look at uh, the chlorides, assuming that chlorides was normal, then if you look at the difference, so we have uh, 120 minus 105, so that is the sodium minus chloride, minus 35, so this 15 minus 35, that makes us minus 20. So the strong ion def deficit is, or difference is, is in the negative, so that means there should be acidosis present, okay. And this happens because of relative hypochloremia, okay. Even though the chloride levels are actually normal, it is considered uh, this is this is uh, acidosis uh, because of relative hypo, hypochloremia. Okay. So here we will actually uh, give uh, just uh, sodium chloride, infused sodium chloride, and uh, things should normalize. Okay. So acidosis should improve uh, with correction of the sodium levels. So we shouldn't start thinking that oh something else is going on. So hyponatremia and acidosis. Uh, can coexist, and this is explained by the Stewart uh, method of acid-base stasis. Nothing else can actually explain it. It's very difficult to explain why uh, hyponatremia is associated with acidosis. Okay. The second thing is the lactate. Okay, so apart from lactate, uh, sorry, apart from chloride, on the right side of the gamma gram, the other strong ion is is the lactate. Uh, it's in very very small amount, so normally less than two uh, milliquint per liter is considered as normal lactate. Okay, so then we look at base axis. This is called lactate base axis effect, and this is uh, considered to be one minus the measured lactate. Okay, so as the plasma lactate concentration increases, equation produces a more negative base axis, and thus an acidosis. So if you say the lactate is 5, so if you measure the lactate and it came as 5, then the lactate base axis becomes 1 minus 5. That is minus 4. Okay. So and that is, uh, again, uh, contributing to a negative base axis. So uh, reduction in sodium ions uh, can produce to negative uh, base axis. And the lactates can produce negative base axis. Okay. And then we come to the albumin, actually. So albumin also can affect uh, the base axis, okay. So if you look at the effective ionic concentration of albumin in milliquint per liter, it is taken as 0 0.25, so one-fourth of the albumin concentration uh, in gram per liter, okay. So if it's, uh, the normal albumin is, say, 42 grams, then one-fourth of 42, that is equal to 10.5 milliquint per liter. So easy way of actually looking at this is at least assume that the, uh, the albumin is 40, okay. Uh, then uh, it's one fourth of 40, that is uh, then be 10 milliequivalent per liter. So that means that uh, uh, we will actually see how this is actually useful in using the in the uh, acid-base data. So acid-base effect of albumin uh, change is uh, calculated from the difference between the uh, reference value and the ionic concentration uh, that corresponds to the patient albumin level. So in the next uh, part, I'm going to show what happens if the albumin levels are on the lower side. Okay. So <clears throat> and again, looking at the gamble gram on the right side, so looking at, like I said, uh, it is basically uh, seen as the uh, one-fourth of the normal albumin level minus the measured albumin level. So for every 10 gram per liter decrease in plasma albumin, the base axis will increase by 2.5 milliequivalent per liter. Okay, so it makes patients more alkalotic. Okay. So let's say the patient's albumin is 22 grams per liter. Okay. So your base axis from the albumin, so albumin base axis effect will be one fourth of 42, which is the normal albumin level minus the measured albumin level which is 22 so the difference between 42 and minus 22 is 20 and one fourth of this is plus 5 okay so you can see that the drop is uh, by 
10 grams into 2. So every 10 grams increases uh, the base axis by 2.5 milli equivalent. And this is increased twice. So it should be 2 into 10. Or that means it will be 2 into 2.5. So it's plus 5. So the base axis actually has gone up. So the albumin, when there is hypoalbuminemia, uh, it can actually cause alkalosis. Okay. So we have seen three effects. Now we've seen the effect of sodium. Uh, we have seen the effect of lactate, and we have seen the effect of albumin. Okay, so three uh, things together. So okay. <clears throat> but despite this, there are other ions uh, which are also present. So, okay. so the base axis effect uh, uh, is the sodium minus chloride effect, plus the lactate effect, plus albumin effect, plus other ion effects. Okay. So we're looking at, uh, for example, uh, the in our example, uh, we got uh, from sodium, we, uh, the effect was 10, lactate uh, was uh, 5, albumin of 22. Sorry that the albumin, uh, sorry, sodium should have actually have read uh, uh, as uh, the, you know, what I had said in that is gone down to 120. It should have read here, sodium of 120, lactate of 5, uh, albumin of 22. <clears throat> So if you look at the base axis, then it becomes sodium minus chloride minus 35. And we've seen that that is, uh, assuming that chloride is normal, and we go that as minus 20. Lactate was 5, 1 minus uh, 5, uh, so we got minus 4. And albumin has dropped to 22, and from that we saw that the base axis was actually, uh, you know, uh, plus 5. So you uh, look at that, you get uh, minus 11. So base axis from this is minus 11. But if your blood gas machine is showing a base deficit of minus 8, that means there must be other ions also which are affecting that. So hypercalcemia, hypermagnesemia, okay, they can actually increase uh, uh, your, or rather bring down the base axis because these are positive or, cat, uh, or uh, you know, cations. Okay. So uh, from the uh, base axis, uh, which we have calculated from the values we have, and uh, from the base axis, which is measured uh, by the uh, machine, uh, we can also look at uh, are there other ions which are actually causing uh, the uh, impact. And uh, so the base axis minus eight and then minus 11, uh, which comes to actually uh, plus three. So we're seeing that there are actually some positive ions uh, which may be raised about normal. Uh, so is it caused by hypercalcemia? Uh, this is being caused by hypermagnesemia. And you can actually send samples and look at uh, these positive ions. Uh, where are these uh, other ions uh, causing this effect? So in uh, simple terms, um, the said simple fire steward approach is basically looking at base axis. Uh, base axis from the sodium chloride difference, base axis from albumin uh, levels, uh, base axis from the lactate. So the first one is called sodium chloride base axis, second one is called lactate base axis, and the albumin base axis. So base axis is equal to your measured sodium uh, minus the measured chloride minus 35. Okay. Uh, lactate base axis is uh, 1 minus lactate. The effect of albumin is taken as the normal albumin minus the measured albumin, and one fourth of that actually gives you the uh, albumin base axis. And the other ions, uh, like I said, can be also be measured and looked at. So you can actually look at normal uh, calcium minus the measured calcium, or normal magnesium minus the uh, measured magnesium, and that uh, can also actually tell us about other ions. And that is only possible if your calculated base axis uh, does not match uh, the measured base axis. In that case, you can also actually find out without actually measuring that there might be something else which is going on. Uh, okay. Or your base axis, measured base axis, must be much, much higher than uh, what you have calculated. Uh, so in that case, there must be some other uh, negative ions uh, which are actually uh, present. Uh, so. Uh, you know other acids you can actually start looking for other other acids uh, uh, for example has the patient consumed salicylates uh, or the patient has been uh, consuming a high amount of alcohol okay. so you can from these uh, you can actually measure 
or at least understand uh, where the other components of the base axis are uh, coming from. There. Okay, so the other uh, parts uh, which are sometimes at least seen is the uh, uh, base uh, buffer base. Okay, and buffer base we do not actually talk about much, and um, that is uh, basically all the sum of all bases in the blood. But this is only looking at the one the blood gas machine can measure. It cannot measure uh, what there is no electrode system for, or there is no um, methods of uh, calculating them. So, okay, so uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, bases uh, which uh, we are looking at are the uh, bipops. Uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin is a good buffer base. Uh, it can buffer um, uh, the hydrogen ions very easily. So the uh, uh, reduced hemoglobin is good. Phosphate system. Um, then again, there are other proteins which are present which may not measure. So we have seen how um, the albumin uh, can buffer hydrogen ions or acidic ions because negatively charged. Uh, so are the other proteins. So uh, other proteins can also be negatively charged. Uh, to at least to do affect that. Okay. So uh, the first step in any um, acid base, uh, you know, uh, looking at the acid base status uh, or balance, the first step uh, should always be clinical evaluation. So uh, history is very very important. So what do you look at the clinical uh, history? So clinical evaluation, you look at signs and symptoms. You look at the vital signs. Is a patient in shock or is there a sepsis, compromised sepsis? We all know that uh, when there is actually uh, a patient is in shock or uh, in sepsis, the uh, lactate levels goes up, patients are acidotic. Okay. Uh, look at the neurological status. So the patient has become unconscious. Okay, and if the patient become unconscious, the respiratory rate might be affected. So his breathing might be affected. Patient might be actually retaining CO2. Okay, so patient might have gone into CO2 narcosis. Um, look at that. Uh, we look so for signs of infection. We can actually increase uh, the uh, catabolism and uh, increase oxygen requirements. So we look at if there is any fever here. We look at the pulmonary sta status. So we look at the respiratory rate. We look at the type of respiration which are present. Uh, we look at uh, if there is any sinuses present. Or is there like, the signs of chronic hypoxemia? So uh, looking at clubbing uh, in the fingers. We also look at history. Has there been a history of you know gastrointestinal symptoms? Has the patient been vomiting? Uh, where there is increased loss of hydrogen ions and chlorides, or diarrhea again, so there can be increased loss of bicarbs in the in the diarrhea. Okay. We would also like to know if there is any other underlying uh, medical condition. Is the patient pregnant? Okay. Does the patient have history of any diabetes? So if you're looking at ketoacidosis, is patient got any history of heart disease? So decrease in the perfusion. So is the patient in, in left ventricular failure? Is patient known COPD? Okay, that's important uh, for looking at the respiratory component. Uh, is there a chronic component of CO2 retention? Now look at liver diseases and kidney diseases. Our patient actually has got a significant liver disease, uh, which can actually release the uh, uh, metabolism of lactates and other acids like ammonia. Kidney diseases, which may mean that the patient is unable to uh, secrete hydrogen ions, okay, or sorry, excrete hydrogen ions and uh, conserve bicarb ions, so uh, that can actually lead to acidosis. So, kidney disease are equally important. So, uh, having a clinical evaluation is the first, very first step looking at the patient's signs and symptoms, looking at the history of the patient. So, these are actually very, very important uh, when you're actually analyzing acid base status. So, uh, never ignore these parts. Okay. Also, if you're working in the uh, your uh, you know A and E, and uh, you got a patient with severe acidosis, I mean, uh, you would also like to know a history of drug and um, uh, ingestion of uh, other compounds. So, 
uh, patients who are on laxative, they develop diarrhea. Okay? They are actually losing lots of bicarb and electrolytes. If the patients are diuretic, increase diuretics, and uh, these these patients become hyponatremic. Okay, and I explain how hyponatremia actually can cause acidosis. May not be uh, because of any uh, you know severe uh, derangement. It's just simple hyponatremia actually causing di uh, because of diuresis causing acidosis. Uh, drugs like uh, topiramate or metformin actually they are known to actually cause lactic acidosis. Patients who actually have diabetes, they might actually have this. You know, the, this is called uh, acetone beta, and uh, that is a that's a smell, the sweetish smell that can actually come uh, from keto acids. Okay, so uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, signs of that, or in patients who have uh, intoxicated with alcohol, uh, you can actually have this uh, isopropyl alcohol breath. Okay. And some patients might just actually present with visual disturbance. This actually happens in methanol intoxication. Okay, this is more in cases of you know poisoning, methanol poisoning. Uh, so these are equally important. And then we come to the second uh, part uh, where we look at uh, the primary acid-based disorder and what is the secondary response. Okay, so uh, very uh, important step. Okay. We all know that the pH uh, of the extracellular fluid is tightly regulated uh, between pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important, like I said, when there is severe acidosis or uh, severe alkalosis, you know uh, that something really is seriously wrong uh, in these patients. So if we actually look at uh, the arterial blood gases and venous blood gases, in that case, the pH is uh, almost the same. So pH in blood gases is 7.4 plus minus 0 0.2, 0 0.02. Uh, blood gases, uh, venous blood gases give pH of 7.36 to 7.38, so slightly on the SRE side. Uh, PCO2 in uh, arterial blood gases is 38 uh, plus or minus 2, so you're looking at anywhere between 36 to 40, but in venous blood it is higher, it's 43 to 48 milliliters of mercury, and I'll come to that. Uh, bicarbs again uh, in the uh, arterial blood is 24 uh, plus minus 2, uh, whereas it's higher in the venous blood, 25 to 26 milliliters of mercury. So what is the difference uh, between these two? Okay, we always say, oh, uh, venous blood gases are actually better than arterial blood gases under anesthesia. Okay, a very, very important question. Why do you think that the uh, uh, we should actually look at venous blood gases more than the arterial blood gases when patients are in anesthesia? And that's very simple because when you look at uh, the uh, you know, monitoring we do, uh, we are actually monitoring the oxygen. You can measure the oxygen uh, in the inspired and expired uh, gases. We are looking at the entire CO2. Okay. So the arterial blood gases actually give you the acid-base status, which is actually happening at the lung level. But when you look at the venous blood gases, they actually give you information about the acid-base status at the tissue level. Okay, what's going on at the muscular level? why there is increased CO2 production okay, at that level. Okay, because the muscles are actually involved. Uh, there is anaerobic metabolism actually going on at the tissue level. That will be, will be detected. But by the time this uh, uh, metabolites actually come into the blood, and blood has got buffers, and uh, so what you're measuring from the arterial part is actually not actually telling you the right uh, amount of status what is going at the tissue level. Okay, so Venous blood gases are actually more important uh, when you're looking uh, things more closely at, uh, you know, at you want to know what's going on at the tissue levels. These values are more important. So uh, to summarize this, let's say that venous blood gases actually are better indicators of what is happening at tissue level, uh, especially at the muscle, okay, which are important areas where the anaerobic metabolism sets in. So looking at the other part of acid-base status, looking at the arterial hydrogen concentration, 
it is. So pH, so pH is very, very important. Based on that, you're going to actually say whether the patient has got acidosis or has got uh, uh, alkalosis. Whether uh, you're looking at uh, whether there is acidemia or there's alkalemia. So uh, pH, the amount of acids uh, which are there in the blood are in very, very small amounts. And so if you look at uh, the hydrogen concentration, uh, you maintain a pH of uh, 7, and the hydrogen ions concentration is 10 to the power of minus 7. That is 0 0.000001. Okay, that's the concentration uh, per liter, millimoles per liter. So it's very, very small. Uh, so that's why then we use the log uh, of the hydrogen ion concentration, and that's why we use the pH. Uh, so acidemia is what you are actually uh, measuring. Okay, so when the pH is less than 7.35, we say there is acidemia present. The process, okay, acidosis is the process. What is it causing? Is it metabolic or is it uh, respiratory? So that is, they say, metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis. We don't say respiratory acidemia or metabolic acidemia. That is not. That is a measurement. That is a value. Acidemia is to do with the pH value. Uh, whereas acidosis is true, what process is actually causing the acidosis, whether it is a respiratory acidosis or is a, it's a uh, you know uh, metabolic acidosis. So there are uh, volatile acids and there are non-volatile acids uh, which can lead to acidosis. So if you look at the volatile acids, okay, of commonest obviously is carbon dioxide, and this is actually now uh, you know the, the vented out by the lungs. So if there is increased amount of CO2 in the body, the respiratory rate will go up and you went out the carbon dioxide. And then there are non-volatile acids uh, which contribute to the hydrogen ion. And uh, things like your keto acids, lactic acids, organic acid, non-organic acids, these all contribute to the hydrogen ions. These are non-volatile acids and these are excreted in the kidneys and they're buffered there. Okay, so uh, kidneys, so both uh, lungs and kidneys are important uh, for the uh, your uh, balancing the uh, acid-base status. So acid-based uh, balance is a relation between the hydrogen ions and the buffer ions to maintain a pH of around normal of 7.4, and uh, this uh, is uh, you know provided this balance is provided by the equation known as the modify Henderson. Hasselbalch equation, which actually states that the hydrogen ion is equal to 24 into PCA2 by 24 uh, by, by car. And this is interesting because uh, if you actually look at uh, the hydrogen ions, uh, which is 40, uh, uh, that gives a pH of 7.4. And if we put these numbers in the equation, uh, so if we have the hydrogen ions of 40, and uh, PCO2 is normally uh, you know uh, also 40 and bicarb is 24. So if you look at the bicarb and uh, in this sign, so bicarb is equal to 24 into PCO2 of 40 by 40. So bicarb is 24. And you can put hydrogen ions and uh, so from each other, so whether you, if you're measuring the PCO2 and hydrogen ions, uh, we can actually know what should be the bicarb ions. Uh, this happens again, this is important. Uh, when we will be discussing uh, about the, uh, uh, you know, the chronic uh, respiratory acidosis, how the bicarb is affected in that, or in long-standing metabolic alkalosis or acidosis. So there's a mixed uh, acidosis, uh, metabolic and respiratory These equations actually then become very, very important. So if, say, the PCO actually goes up, so this is looking at the primary response, okay, so your PCO has gone up, uh, so the pH should actually come down, and that is uh, when we look at uh, the hydrogen ions. So PCO2 is 48, bicarb is 24, uh, so that actually uh, leads to the hydrogen ions of 48. So it's increased, the hydrogen ions are increased from 40 uh, to 48, and this actually drops the pH to 7.38. So uh, this tells us how that we already know that, okay, increased CO2 will, uh, will reduce the pH, but this actually quantifies it. So this is quantification of what changes do you expect uh, from a known value of, of the uh, you know, CO2 levels. 
So why is pH is very, very important? We all know this, that all enzymes like the system have to work at optimal pH. Uh, so any disturbances in pH can uh, lead to disruption of metabolism. And it's, if it is severe enough, it can actually be life-threatening. And molecular ionization is also based on uh, the uh, pH. So if you look at uh, alkalosis, okay, if the patient is hyperventilated, if somebody hyperventilates, they can actually develop hypocalcemic tightening, right? So, uh, you know, they, this is because of hypercalcemia. The amount of the ionized uh, uh, calcium is reduced. And so you just ask them to slow down or, uh, you know, give them a bag to breathe in to increase the uh, CO2 levels, and that comes to normal. Uh, so it also explains uh, molecular ionization. Uh, distribution of ions across cell membrane, obviously, especially the potassium, as it depends on a pH. And uh, we know that as the acidosis actually uh, increases, so, so does the hydrogen ions. So the potassium, so hyperkalemia in acidosis is common. So if you treat the acidosis, the potassium moves back into the cells and uh, we can actually normalize that. Again, we also know that the oxygen dissociation curve actually shifts to the right or left depending on your pH or hydrogen ion concentration. Okay. So the uh, body tries to resist uh, these uh, changes, and this happens because of the uh, buffers. Okay. And the important buffers in the system are carbonic acid, or the bicarb system, and there is di-basic di uh, phosphate, hydrogen uh, phosphates, and the protein systems. Okay. And uh, carbonic or acid or bicarb system is uh, very easy to measure because we measure them all the time. Uh, and we have seen that uh, the, I will show that uh, image again, uh, that uh, the bicarbonic uh, or the bicarbonate system is actually involved in both the renal as well as phosphatic concentration. So carbon dioxide actually combines uh, with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid, which again dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonates. Uh, CO2 we know can be vented out by uh, the uh, lungs and bicarbs uh, and the hydrogen ions can be excreted uh, through the kidneys. So this is a very, very important buffer system, bicarb system. Yeah. And uh, we have a large amount of bicarbs in our blood. And this is maintained around 24 millimoles per liter. Uh, the range is between 21 to 28 millimoles per liter. So, so two of its uh, key components are under uh, physiological control, like I said. So carbon dioxide by the lungs, bicarb by the kidneys. And uh, uh, this was a diagram I had already shown you how CO2 is vented out through the uh, uh, lungs as a volatile acid. And whereas the hardy ions are buffered by bicarbs in the kidneys. So these are very, very important system. <clears throat> So we're looking at the primary and the uh, secondary changes. So this equation, uh, henderson hasselbalch equation, is very, very important uh, to know. So uh, pH is equal to pKa of blood, which is 6.1, plus log of bicarb divided by 0 0.03 into pCO2. <clears throat> so if the bicarb levels actually are uh, seen, so if the bicarb levels goes down, we know that there is metabolic acidosis. Or if the bicarbs go up, we know that there is metabolic alkalosis. So bicarb is important to know the metabolic components. So first change in metabolic disturbances is seen in the bicarb levels. So what are the secondary uh, changes will occur? Secondary changes will occur in the respiratory uh, system. It's compensation. Respiratory compensation occurs very, very quickly. Okay. So if the patient is actually acidotic, uh, you would start actually hyperventilating. You see the patient will be hyperventilating. Uh, to red, get rid of the carbon dioxide. So that is your secondary uh, change after, okay. So that is what happens uh, with bicarbs. So bicarbs, you're looking at a metabolic component. Okay. Increase in bicarb, you know, alkalosis, decrease in bicarb, and uh, that is acidosis. But if you look at the CO2, okay, so that is at the uh, denominator part of it. Uh, so uh, primary, this is the primary chain respiratory acidosis. So when you're looking at acidosis or alkalosis, and then second thing you look at is, is the CO2. Is, is the CO2 normal? Is it gone up or is it uh, gone down? So when CO2 is there, then obviously yeah, things are happening at the lungs, isn't it? So you are causing, you, obviously then it can't, lung itself can't participate uh, in the compensation. 
Uh, so the compensation has to happen through the renal, uh, okay, through the kidneys. So if there is acidosis, uh, in that case, the uh, they will actually uh, you know combine. There is increased excretion of iodine ions, uh, which will then uh, combine with uh, bicarb and other uh, buffers uh, in the kidneys. Okay, or if there is a reduction in carbon dioxide uh, level, uh, then the kidneys will stop. Uh, secreting or excreting the hardening ions, they will conserve the hardening ions and uh, try to normalize uh, your uh, blood pH. So this equation is actually again very very important. And so the role of kidneys is very very important because of the buffers. Okay, so uh, kidneys uh, come into play. Uh, they take around uh, 12 to 24 hours or sometimes longer. And uh, the three of the most important buffers. Uh, in the kidneys are bicarbs, uh, the phosphates, and the ammonia. Okay. And if you look at it, uh, the 40% uh, of the non-volatile acids, and that is almost uh, 30 milliequivalents per day, uh, which are uh, made by the body uh, because of the whatever we consume, uh, are excreted <coughs> as titrable acid okay, through the phosphate system. We will explain that. And 60% uh, of the non-volatiles, uh, which about contribute of 50 milliequivalent per day, is excreted as ammonia. Okay. Ammonia is, you know that in uh, patients who develop uh, liver failure, you can actually smell the ammonia. Okay, so ammonia is also a non-volatile uh, acid, uh, but can be also be uh, you know excreted. So the pK of the bicarb system is 6.1, and uh, that is actually got the lower lowest buffering. Even though it has got the it is highest amount, uh, it has uh, got a lowest buffering. Whereas the ammonia has got the highest. So if you look at the graph on the right side, and uh, that is uh, showing the the relationship between the uh, your pH and pKa. And uh, if you look at uh, the uh, red ones, so renal buffering, I said uh, you remember APH. So ammonia is greater than phosphate, is greater than bicarb, uh, APH. So the buffering is actually maximum uh, with the, uh, the uh, ammonia system. Uh, it's intermediate uh, with the phosphate system, and it is least uh, with the bicarb. <clears throat> uh, and the bicarb, the reason being the bicarb actually are uh, maximally uh, you know, absorbed. So if you look at uh, what happens in the kidneys, the uh, concentration of bicarb and the uh, you know and the plasma and the gomer filtrate is, is constant is 24 milliequivalent per liter uh, <clears throat> whereas for phosphate is only very small it is only 1.5 milliequivalent per liter uh, so in the proximal tubule itself and uh, there is maximum absorption reabsorption of uh, bicarb occurs so this is called recombination okay so the bicarb is actually reclaimed whatever is uh, uh, you know um, uh, filtered uh, by the kidneys, uh, almost all of it is actually the maximum amount of it is uh, reclaimed. So about 45,000 milliequivalents of bicarbs are filtered and reabsorbed every day. Uh, <clears throat> so there is preservation of uh, buffer uh, bases occur uh, in the kidneys. Uh, and if you look at the other buffer systems, so we also have the uh, uh, phosphate system. So phosphates and uh, they are. Uh, uh, you know, uh, excreted as uh, sodium hydrogen phosphate. Uh, so uh, it is disodium hydrogen phosphate, and the sodium dissociates from the disodium phosphate. And because one uh, cation is dissociated, it is able to actually take another cation. So the disodium uh, hydrogen phosphate now becomes sodium dihydrogen phosphate. So it picks up a hydrogen ion. And this is how the phosphate buffering occurs. Since the ammonia is, uh, is produced from the metabolism of the amino acids, uh, we uh, consume amino acids. Uh, we produce lots of ammonia and NH3. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, ammonia uh, in liver diseases is not, uh, uh, you know, this is, can be dangerous. It is bypassed, absorbed into, and that can cause CNS symptoms. But that is obviously another topic. <coughs> So this ammonia is NH3, so it can actually uh, also uh, attach another hydrogen ions to form uh, ammonium. Okay, so four hydrogen ions uh, attached to nitrogen, that is ammonium, three uh, hydrogen ions is ammonia. 
So this whole thing, all the buffering is actually happening at the kidney level. So bicarb buffering, phosphate buffering, ammonium buffering. So all the, the amount of acid which you produce in the body is huge. And uh, they need to be buffered. And, and that's what happens in kidney failure. So when the kidney fail, uh, one thing, and they uh, the amount of hydrogen ions uh, excreted into the urine is reduced. So they are retaining hydrogen ions. At the same time, uh, the buffers are not reabsorbed. And so the buffering capacity uh, and the buffers uh, we are reabsorbed or reclaimed. Or re and hence, the patients uh, in renal failure, they have acidosis. Uh, they commonly present with acidosis. Okay. The only limiting factor uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, this amount of hydrogen ion uh, excreted in the urine and thing is the pH of the urine. Okay, so the uh, maximum uh, gradient again, which the hydrogen ions can be pumped into the urine or uh, can excrete it, and uh, that corresponds to a urinary pH of 4.4. So, uh, monitoring the pH of urine is actually very important. So, uh, you know the hydrogen concentration in urine. Urine is very very acidic. You just need to watch the male's urine. <laughs> you know on the on the floor, they they actually even discolor the uh, vina is there. So they are very con. They are, I mean, the hydrogen ions, uh, amount of hydrogen ions in urine is almost uh, 1,000 times uh, that big of the concentration uh, in the plasma. Uh, so the pH uh, uh, reached in the collecting tubules is around 4.5. This is before uh, even the urine formation occurs. Okay. Uh, so if there were no buffers uh, in the urine, so there, there are no uh, phosphate buffers, bicarb uh, buffers, or uh, the ammonia buffers, in that case, the pH in the urine will actually be achieved very, very quickly. Okay. And then the hydrogen uh, ions will secretion will stop, and this will lead to severe acidosis. That's what actually happens uh, in uh, the uh, renal failure uh, patients. So uh, the pH of urine is actually reached uh, very quickly. And so there is uh, retention of hydrogen ions and uh, reduced uh, reabsorption of bicarbonate ions. Okay. So uh, we look at the primary acid-based disturbance and now we're looking at the secondary compensatory response. And uh, I've actually already explained to you uh, that in metabolic acidosis, the pH is uh, less than 7.38. Uh, bicarb buffer, uh, sorry, bicarb levels are low. So because bicarbs are consumed, uh, so the bicarb levels are low. So low pH, then you look at the uh, bicarb, if the bicarb are low, that is obviously that's a metabolic acidosis. So the first response uh, for this is obviously going to be respiratory. So hydrogen ions will stimulate the respiration. Uh, we will start uh, actually uh, then, you know, uh, you know, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So what is the PCO2 you expect at that pH, okay, or that bicarb level? It's given by this equation that 1.5 times the bicarb plus eight or six to 10 millimeters of mercury is this should be the CO2, okay. So you can actually see that, or in a simple way, uh, whatever your bicarb level is, uh, you add 15 millimeters of mercury, that is the expected CO2 in metabolic acidosis. So, say bicarb here is 22, and the uh, uh, if you add 15 to that, it becomes uh, 37. Okay, so normal uh, CO2 is 40. Uh, so, by getting uh, hyperventilating, you actually reduce uh, this to 34. So, this is the PCO2 uh, which you expect. And this becomes important when you want to know is there a compensation or not? Okay, is there renal compensation occurring or not? So uh, this uh, complete secondary adaptive responses occur within 12 to 24 hours. Okay. And like I said in the second part, I will actually discuss uh, more in details uh, whether to know that if there has been compensation. Uh, if there is a mixed metabolic uh, or respiratory acidosis, okay, we will actually discuss in the second part of that. Metabolic acidosis is opposite of that. So in um, the metabolic uh, alkalosis, pH has gone up, obviously. 
and uh, so has the uh, amount of bicarb level. So bicarb is increased uh, in metabolic alkalosis. Uh, so what is going to be the respiratory response? We are going to, this is going to be uh, depression of the, uh, uh, your uh, respiration will occur and the PCO2 will go up. How much does the PCO2 actually go up? So that is 0.7 times the bicarb minus 24. So if you look at it, uh, plus 40 millimeters of mercury. So that is 40 is a normal, that is our normal CO2. Okay, over that, uh, with the, how much does that thing goes? For example, here, if you lay, look at it, so bicarb is 26, 26 minus 24 is 2, and into 2.7 is, is 1.4. So you are expecting the uh, uh, your um, CO2 be around 40 plus 1.4. Uh, 4 so that's 41.4 or you can actually look at the bicarb plus 15 so bicarb is 26 26 plus 15 okay that should be our uh, level of co2 expected uh, in case of metabolic acidosis and again completely secondary uh, adaptive response can occur in 24 to 36 hours and this is often renal and okay because the kidney actually has to excrete uh, you know uh, these uh, bicarbs uh, so that the pH can be restored back to normal so it need to retain hydrogen ions and the excrete the bicarb ions and this takes around 24 to 36 hours so that's the renal compensation uh, occurring so you can normalize so that is only possible by knowing uh, this equation so if your CO2 actually doesn't match uh, the bicarb uh, we are actually saying that you know that then the uh, renal uh, response has actually occurred. Okay. Respiratory acidosis is easy again. pH is less than 7.3. Then look at the CO2. Uh, CO2 is more than uh, 40 okay, here. Uh, so uh, PCO2 more than 42. So that can lead to uh, respiratory acidosis. So in secondary uh, metabolic response uh, here, the now the lungs are the cause. Okay, you're not breathing enough. Uh, so CO2 is being retained. So the lungs can't do anything. So it has to happen at the kidney level. So what happens in this case is because there is acidosis, so the bicarb has to go up. So in acute setting, bicarb is increased by one millimole per liter uh, for each PACO2 increase of 10 millimeters above 40 millimeters of mercury. So if the if the CO2 goes up uh, by, to 50 millimeters mercury, then bicarb will go up by one millimoles in acute setting. So there will never be uh, in normalization will not occur. But in chronic cases, this increase goes up by four to five millimoles per liter for every 10 millimeters increase above normal CO2. So there is greater, uh, you know, compensation with chronic uh, kind of uh, respiratory acidosis. And uh, the uh, complete uh, secondary adaptive response that can take almost two to five days. So in respiratory alkalosis, uh, the renal uh, system doesn't kick in uh, till two to, two to five days. And again, uh, this can be superimposed uh, with metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. And how we actually find that out, uh, that is second part of the lecture. Respiratory alkalosis is again because of hyperventilation. So your CO2 is less than 38. Uh, pH has gone up by 7.42. And again, uh, we're going to have secondary metabolic response. This is going to be kidneys here. Okay. So in acute setting, uh, the bicarb is reduced by 2 millimoles for every 10 millimeter mole increase in uh, CO2 above 40. Oh, sorry, below 40. And in chronic, it is 4 to 5 millimoles per liter for each PaCO2 decrease uh, of 10 millimeters of, uh, below 40. Okay. So again, it is greater. So uh, bicarb. Uh, is being excreted, hydrogen ions is being uh, uh, conserved uh, to bring the pH to normal. And again, the kidneys will take two to five days uh, to uh, normalize things. So kidney uh, response is slow uh, compared to the respiratory response which occurs uh, in metabolic components. Okay. So with this, uh, we will end our uh, first part of the uh, acid-base balance because these are actually long lectures. It's no point going through everything. And the second part of the lecture we will probably take uh, next week uh, on, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably on Tuesday or Wednesday, probably. I'll, I will announce uh, on the uh, thing. So we will likely have it on.